Tendi far in listen only mode. Hi, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, EBM Tools Network for short. Uh, we're very glad you could join us today. Um, this webinar series is uh, co-sponsored by uh, Open Channels in addition to the EBM Tools Network and we're glad they can also participate. Um, and we'd like to welcome today, we have Will McClintock uh, from UC Santa Barbara who's going to be speaking today about using SeaSketch for collaborative design of ocean management plans. Before we get started, there's just a couple things I wanted to let everyone know. There'll be time at the end of the presentation for interactive question and answers, um, but um, if you want to send in questions during the presentation, you can do that by uh, typing in the questions to the question panel of your user interface. Um, any clarifying questions, like what an acronym stands for, um, I can ask Will during the presentation, but more substantive questions will hold to the end. But you can go ahead and send the questions in at any time, and we encourage you to do so. Uh, during the Q&A at the end of the presentation, uh, there's another way to ask questions in addition to sending them in during the question panel. Uh, you can also raise your virtual hand and then I can unmute you and you can, um, you can ask the questions directly to Will. Uh, that option will only work, however, if, if you're on the phone, if you've entered your PIN number and if you're on the computer, if you have a working mic. Um, and then during the Q&A, you can, of course, always send in questions by typing them in to the question panel. So anyway, uh, we got that. Well, uh, Will, we're really glad you could be with us today, and uh, we'll turn things over to you. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, let, me, let me start off by thanking you, Sarah and Nick Wenner, for um, hosting the EBM Tools uh, webinar series. It means a lot to me to be able to present, and uh, it's been really meaningful over the years to have this um, available to me as an EBM Tools practitioner to hear about what other people have been doing. So thanks very much for that. Um, I also uh, I want to point out that I'll be talking about um, SeaSketch, which is a software service that you can reach at seasketch.org through any common web browser. Uh, it works with IE8 or greater, Firefox 4-20 or greater, Safari 6.1 or greater, and Chrome. Um, and it's a it's a it's a project that we started about three years ago, um, and we, we began by um, getting some funding through ESRI and some partner organizations, the Department of Conservation in New Zealand, um, the Tyndall Falk Foundation, and folks supporting the Marine Planning Partnership uh, up in the North Pacific Coast. So I want to acknowledge their, their contributions and all the ideas that we've been able to uh, glean from those partners over the last couple of years. Um, I especially want to also acknowledge uh, the folks that are doing the heavy lifting in my lab, Chad Burt, who's the lead developer. Todd Bryan, Senior Developer, Dan Yoakum, Spatial Analyst, and uh, Grace Goldberg, who's Projects Manager. Um, what I want to do is uh, talk about uh, a, a planning process um, that is happening in, uh, or happened in Barbuda. Uh, but before I, I jump into Barbuda, and I'm going to talk about the North Pacific Coast a little bit too, um, I just want to uh, show you this map of where all the um, projects in SeaSketch are. Uh, most of these projects are in dark gray, and these are demonstration projects, which are super easy to set up. And that's the first point I want to make here is that SeaSketch is very, very simple to uh, set up and create new projects. Um, and I encourage you, any of you listening um, today, if you're interested in having your own demonstration project to play around with, um, there's you can request one from me, and I'm happy to set that up for you. Um, and you're also welcome to hit this page, uh, the projects page, um, and just explore any of these, these projects because they're all public. Uh, just note that some of the features in some of these projects are private uh, to certain users who've been given permission to access those features. I can talk more about those later. Um, so all of these projects are running on a single application in the cloud, and they tap into uh, various geoprocessing services, and web mapping services uh, that, are, that are hosted uh, in the cloud on AWS, Amazon Web Services. So I'm going to tell you about this particular project in, in Barbuda, and I'll touch on just a little bit of this project up here in, in British Columbia. So first, this one in, in Barbuda. So for those of you who don't know, Barbuda is uh, a, a uh, sister island to um, Antigua. Antigua and Barbuda are um, in the Northeastern Caribbean. Um, 
and this is a the island is is really pretty small. It's only got about 1,800 people living on it, uh, but they depend very heavily on their um, fisheries. Uh, just about everybody on the island fishes, and there are about 50 commercial fishermen on the island. And uh, the Weight Institute did some research and, and found that uh, this was a really good place to conduct a comprehensive marine spatial planning exercise uh, because their, their, their fisheries are in real trouble. Just compared to even 10 years ago, uh, folks there will tell you routinely they're seeing much smaller uh, and far fewer uh, of the important um, species for, for them from a, from a fishing perspective. So lo uh, lobster, conch, and, uh, and, and various reef fish in particular are uh, on the decline. So uh, in late 2012, Iana Johnson, who's the executive director of the Wade Institute, visited the island and essentially proposed that, that she and a, a team of experts could come down at the expense of the Wade Institute and, uh, and do some uh, basic uh, dive surveys to, to get some baseline information about uh, what was happening around the, the island and oceans, uh, and then um, uh, designs, help, help uh, the, the community design some marine spatial plans um, that would meet certain science and policy guidelines set out by the uh, Barbuda Council, and then um, provide some uh, um, expertise in terms of designing monitoring plans and enforcement plans. So what we're looking at right here is is uh, is a uh, sea sketch project, um, which you can get to by typing in barbuda.seasketch.org. You can find it on our projects page. Um, and I'm not going to go through all the various features in this tool. I'm just going to show you some of the, the key features uh, as they related to the planning process. So the first thing I want to point out is that, um, like I said, there was a team of experts that went down, about 20 divers led by Ben Ruttenberg at Cal Poly uh, San Luis Obispo. Um, and those uh, divers went to about 200 different dive sites and um, looked at the size and distribution and, and abundance of various uh, critters, um, like lobster and conch. And uh, so what we're looking at here is just some uh, points uh, that show the, the um, size and distribution and abundance of these species. So those data were collected initially and put in a spreadsheet, and then that spreadsheet was turned into a shapefile, and then I published the shapefile as a map service. And now what we're looking at here uh, is the, uh, the, the points associated with a map service um, that uh, is published on a server, not the C-Sketch server, but a separate server that's running ArcGIS server. So that's the first thing about this tool is that it's able to display map services published uh, um, on uh, distributed servers throughout uh, sort of throughout the globe, right? So it can be either Esri-based map services or WMS. These happen to be Esri-based map services. So once we've done these baseline surveys, then we also talked uh, to Sam Perkis at Nova Southeastern and asked him to uh, take this aerial photo of, of the island and derive a habitat map from it. So he did that offline and then created a first draft habitat map which uh, using these uh, uh, divers who, who were also looking at um, you know the, the, the other stuff, biological stuff, they did some sort of ground truthing and after that came up with this this uh, habitat map which shows the distribution of um, seagrass, patch reef, hard bottom, continuous reef, and sand around the island. So that was a uh, kind of a, a quick and dirty way of deriving a, a pretty good habitat map um, the, the reason why we could do that is because it's generally pretty shallow around the island. Um, so this, this sort of um, analysis is, is uh, possible because it could, I think it's about something like 30, meter, uh, 30 meters down is when we start to, to lose um, the optical signal. Um, but a lot of this water is less than 30 meters deep. It's only over here on the, on the southeastern side of the island and the northern part of the island where, where we really couldn't get good signal. 
So we have these uh, survey data in C-Sketch. We also have a habitat map in C-Sketch. Um, the only thing left to do at this point was to find out where we, people were fishing and how valuable those various fishing grounds were uh, to them so that we could use that information uh, to begin planning some zones. And the idea of the zones, of course, was to, to, uh, to create more sustainable fisheries in, in, uh, in Barbuda. So we began by uh, talking to fishermen and asking them to answer some uh, spatial questions. So some of those questions uh, were things like, where do you keep your boat? And where do you take tourists on your boat? Where do you fish? This one was really key, where do you fish? Um, not only did we ask them where did they fish, but uh, how, you know, when did they fish there? What types of gear did they use? Um, what was the target species? Um, that probably wouldn't work. <laughs> Let's go with that. Uh, there we go. Um, and then once they identified where they were fishing, uh, they could submit those, those, um, the answers to those surveys, and we could extract them. Well, first of all, let me show you the, the sort of uh, responses to, to all these questions. So here we're looking at the, the sum total of all of the responses by all of the fishermen in Barbuda in terms of where they fish, what they're fishing for, and the value, the relative value of each of those places to them as, as fishers. So that information was captured in C-Sketch. Um, and we did this by sitting down with people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, none of the fishermen responded to these questions online, not because they didn't have um, uh, internet access. A lot of them did, or a few of them did anyway. Um, but it was important for us to sort of establish a relationship with the fishermen, obviously, to get them to uh, provide this kind of information about where they were fishing and so on. So we sat with them with a laptop uh, connected to a cellular network, um, and because it's a web-based application, and had them indicate to us where they were fishing and so on. We captured all that information in these surveys. So we're looking at the responses here. Um, these these uh, um, polygons were then uh, downloaded as a, uh, a zip file containing all the shape files. Uh, and then those shape files were summarized offline to create a heat map. Right? And that heat map, for example, um, showed the distribution of valued fishing grounds around, around Barbuda. So this map here is showing us that up in the northern part of, of the island, just outside the lagoon, there's a really valuable fishing ground um, shown in red. And then uh, areas in yellow are also valuable, but not quite as valuable. Areas in blue are not very valuable, and areas that um, are uh, lacking color, or just the color of the background here, um, are areas where uh, people said they essentially were not fishing, um, or they were, they were of zero value. Okay, so with those three, uh, really two key bits of information, the distribution of habitats and the distribution of valued fishing grounds, um, we then held community meetings, uh, we had stakeholder meetings, we had meetings with just fishermen, we had meetings with just individuals down at the docks, and we said, in essence, uh, your government has agreed to do a comprehensive zoning process. Part of that zoning process will involve um, creating uh, no-take marine sanctuaries. The idea is that these sanctuaries are going to lead to spillover uh, in a few years um, and a more sustainable source of fish to you as fishermen. So given that, where would you like a sanctuary to be? Um, and then we just ask them to sketch out prospective sanctuaries. So for example, um, they would just choose create new, or we would, sitting at their side, create new sanctuary. Um, they'd draw a sanctuary that overlapped the three nautical mile boundary, which was the area of interest, the study area, and the area that uh, the Barbuda Council has jurisdiction over. Um, they'd give it a name. And then they'd uh, click save. Oops. And um, then they would have this polygon that they drew in their My Plans tab, or in my case, My Plans tab, um, which is a private sandbox. Nobody else can see it but me because I have um, I've logged in. And then they can run a report. And the reports here are really simple. They're just showing this, this 
the size of the of the sanctuary, the habitats that I've captured within the sanctuary, um, and the amount of uh, fishing value that I might displace should this become a no-take zone. So here it's just saying I've captured 8% of Barbuda's waters. It falls within the recommended size guidelines. Um, I've captured this much uh, continuous reef and deep water, hard bottom, and so on. And I could potentially displace 7.3% of the fishing value um, in the short term. And notice that these, these reports are also linked to the data that they're, uh, the map services that they're analyzing. So this one um, is analyzing the, the fishing value layer. This particular report is analyzing the habitats layer. Then one can take these uh, individual sanctuaries and add them to collections. And you can think of collections as uh, just prospective complete plans. Um, so I've just moved this um, thing I've drawn into a folder that contains all of these polygons. These, this could be a complete plan, but obviously it's not. A complete plan looks more like this. So I'm going, to an, I'm going into one of our discussion forums, and I'm uh, opening up a uh, discussion thread that I started uh, just a few days ago for this presentation. And it includes this thing. Let me turn this layer off for now. So this thing is the complete zoning plan that was signed into law last month. Um, and uh, it, you can run a report on that whole plan, uh, which includes all of these zones. And the report um, 87% of the lagoon area. There are six sanctuaries that represent 33% of Barbuda's waters. Um, there are also some no net zones. Um, that's the stuff in orange here, um, where uh, you can do everything except use uh, nets, unless, of course, you're in a sanctuary, in which case there's, uh, there's no take at all. There's also some mooring areas. Um, so these are areas where uh, people are permitted to uh, drop an anchor or set up a mooring. mooring. Um, and uh, these are essentially places that um, are um, without reef. Uh, they're, they're just kind of sand and um, seagrass, but not very sensitive to dropping an anchor. So this plan um, is, was developed in uh, less than 18 months. Um, actually, the plan was developed in about six months, but the whole planning process of gathering data and, um, and uh, engaging stakeholders uh, and then getting it through the, the um, uh, sort of the, the legal system only took 18 months. That's pretty fast. It, 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 this is the final product, but it started out looking like this. So this is the first draft uh, that was created actually by the Barbuda Council. Um, within about 30 minutes, they proposed uh, this system of no-take reserves. And um, it's, you can tell it's, it's different from the, the one I just showed you, the final product, in several ways. First, there's uh, differences in uh, the boundaries of the sanctuaries, the number of sanctuaries, and um, it, the, the first product or the first proposal didn't include no-take zones or a shipping lane or a, or a uh, uh, mooring and anchorage zone. So it was through the course of, of about six months, um, again, engaging stakeholders and community members and going back to the council, that they, they began kind of adding some of these elements and tweaking some of these uh, boundaries by copying the Barbuda Council's proposal, um, so say copying a sanctuary and then modifying the boundaries in C-Sketch um, and then posting it back to one of these forums. And over time, the, the uh, the, the proposal grew to include, include more elements, and it uh, grew to be uh, more accepted by the um, by the stakeholders. So how how did how do we know this? How is becoming more and more accepted? Well, primarily through these types of forums, where, uh, for example, we would have a meeting with the, all the fishermen and ask them to express their their opinions about um, uh, a proposal, and then. I would, or my colleagues would, um, record their responses in these meetings. So the, 
again, that the stakeholders themselves weren't using the tool mainly because uh, we just felt it was a small enough island we could meet practically with everybody on the island. Um, and, and meeting face to face was an important part of building a relationship and getting them involved. Uh, but they could access this online. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you why that was kind of important in just a second here. But when we went to the Barbuda Council and said, you know, um, here's what the community thinks about this proposal, inevitably somebody would say, um, you know, what does so and so think about uh, a particular proposal? Um, what does Joyride, believe it or not, this is a guy's name, Joyride, I love this guy. Um, what does Joyride think about this proposal? Because he does a lot of fishing down there. We know he does a lot of fishing down there, and, and we don't want to have a no-take zone in an area where he can't live with it. So we could, in a council meeting, find the, uh, the response from Joyride about a particular sanctuary and say, look, Joyride thinks this is a great place for a sanctuary. And that moved the discussion along. Without this kind of documentation, without these comments that are, that are tied to specific geographical elements and proposal elements, um, this conversation would have taken a lot, lot longer. So notice that um, not only are uh, um, these comments uh, attached to plans, they also have map bookmarks. So we could easily find out where people were supporting things or where they had problems with the various proposals. And there are other ways to kind of drive that information um, that we use, but I'll just kind of keep it short. So the, these, these forums were a great way of showing the, uh, the, the Barbuda Council, the ultimate decision makers, what people around the island thought about these proposals as they were evolving. Um, they were also really good in engaging uh, scientists, experts from uh, UC Santa Barbara remotely. Um, so not all the scientists at UCSB can obviously make it down to, to uh, Barbuda to comment on stakeholder proposals as they're evolving, but they can um, participate in these discussion forums. And so, for example, uh, Steve Gaines is a researcher uh, and, and, and professor here at UC Santa Barbara, um, expressed a concern about uh, some of the, the uh, uh, proposals that were evolving. Um, and this was important to the, to, the, to the council because they wanted to know what experts thought about these proposals. They, some of the sort of expert opinion were baked into these analytics, right? So if you, if you drew a, a uh, proposal for a network of sanctuaries around the island or, or even a, a proposal for just a single sanctuary, you get some feedback on whether or not you were meeting science or policy guidelines for, say, the size of the sanctuary or, or the, the, the amount of habitat that you captured. Um, but um, they, but, but uh, it was important that the, the, count, the council really felt that it was important that um, they get some direct feedback from, from uh, respected scientists who had experience in marine protected area planning um, uh, on, on these proposals as well as get those. Um, so just to kind of, I think I skipped over that pretty quickly, so I want to go back and take a look at that final proposal, I drive the point home here. Um, this was the final uh, proposal um, that was signed into law. And this report is showing us that um, there is a goal of, of capturing 33% of all the key habitats in, inside no-take zones. And, and um, the report is also showing us where we've met or where we failed to meet those guidelines. So 33% three, uh, was that 33% threshold was met by all these in green, deep water, patchy sand, and seagrass, and just barely not met by hard bottom and, and continuous reef habitats. So that's the kind of analytical feedback that the, the council really wanted to see both in the tool and uh, by way of direct feedback from the scientists. Okay, so um, I encourage you all to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move just in a second here to talking about another, another project really briefly, but I encourage you all to check out barbuda.csketch.org and just comb through these uh, discussion forums to get a sense of how these discussion forums work. Um, in addition to uh, um, map bookmarks and the ability to attach uh, plans that have been sketched, uh, one can also have, 
create drawings to highlight uh, particular areas. So here's a drawing, here's a drawing that are attached to this particular message. Um, and one can actually attach files to these things too. So here I've, I've attached a, a file which is simply a picture of the executive director, Ayanna Johnson, holding up the newspaper um, that's announcing that uh, the Blue Halo plan is now law. Um, but these were forms where we could do things like post uh, scientific papers that support certain kinds of um, uh, conservation measures or papers about um, uh, uh, approaches to monitoring and enforcement. While I'm on that topic, um, it's important to recognize that, that that uh, this plan that we're looking at here that's now uh, signed into law isn't just a, a plan on paper. There, there is a, the, the Wade Institute is also supporting over the next five years a comprehensive monitoring and enforcement plan. So Shah Selby as an individual went down and uh, took a look at these plans and, and created a document that uh, provides uh, enforcement personnel in Barbuda a comprehensive plan for how to enforce these, and the Wade Institute is actually supplying a boat and other resources to help enforce, enforce these. Um, Andy Estep is an individual who now is down in Barbuda, and he's setting up a monitoring program. Uh, there's a lot of uh, people on the island who have now been trained by the Wade Institute to do dive surveys and assist with that monitoring program. So this really is not just a, um, a set of uh, paper parks and regulations, they will be enforced and monitored, and we'll have a good sense of how well these, these plans are working over the next five years um, by, by tracking all that uh, monitoring information. Okay, so um, the little bit of sketching I showed you and analysis is, is something uh, some people refer to as geodesign. So iterative sketching and analysis is nice because it, it allows the user of an application like this to draw virtually any perspective plan and get some idea of the potential consequences of that plan. So in this case, the potential consequences might be you know, uh, um, protection of certain kinds of key habitats or potential impacts to, to uh, fishers. What geodesign does not do, sort of out of the box, if you will, is give you a sense of what the, of the ultimate plan looks like or an optimal plan based on certain kinds of criteria. And I'm sure a lot of you who are listening are familiar with the variety of tools out there that, that can um, uh, guide people in this way into to making more optimal decisions. And, and one of them, probably the most popular, uh, certainly the most popular in the marine conservation realm is, is MarkSAM. So I want to uh, just quickly jump to this, this project that was developed for the Marine Planning Partnership in the North Pacific Coast, or MAP. Um, the reason I want to show you this is because uh, it's a good demonstration of how we've combined an optimization approach um, that is MarkSan with the geodesign approach. So here I'm looking at um, the, the distribution of sort of um, high value, high conservation value uh, um, areas in uh, the North Pacific coast. So areas of lower value in yellow, areas in high value, dark red. And I've sketched uh, a whole bunch of plans up here in the north and put them in a folder. And then that folder has, has a report, this report, that tells me a whole bunch of things. I'll focus first on this graph. This graph is just showing me the average sum solution score for all of these zones that I've drawn together. Um, and, and, there, and this is just telling me that it's, it, the, the average score is 31.5, placing in the mid-quantile range. So it's a kind of, a mild, if, you, if you will, a mildly good proposal for um, uh, conservation zones, if these were all conservation zones. Um, in other words, no take of some sort or some other kind of conservation measures. Um, and a lot of that information is kind of described here. Um, the nice thing I just want to... Uh, sort of say is that this, this is um, a nice way of introducing um, uh, MarkSan or some other kind of optimization tool uh, because, in my opinion, um, uh, some people react uh, uh, strongly to uh, anything which smacks of a suggestion that this might be good for some sort of criteria that you didn't create. Um, here, some, in geodesign, if somebody just says that I think this is a good zone for conservation for whatever reason, um, they can do that and then uh, measure that kind of arbitrary opinion uh, 
against um, what Marxan or some other tool tells them. Okay, so we've combined Marxan with GeoDesign in C-Sketch for this particular project in the North Pacific Coast. Um, I thought I'd also point out that you know, these are really detailed um, uh, uh, reports. One of the reports I really like is um, this one that combines some uh, invest output, output from invest, which is a marine invest, which is another really great planning tool. Um, so I'm going to turn this off. And uh, we're just now looking at the, the distribution of um, valued recreation areas. And you can read about uh, how that was calculated. But based on this particular analysis, I've drawn um, uh, zones that, uh, on average, are not of high uh, importance when it comes to um, tourism. Again, combining uh, other methods and other tools in, uh, used in marine conservation and marine spatial planning uh, with um, geodesign in C-Sketch. Um, okay, so that's, there's a lot there, but I'm, I'm trying to sort of give you a broad overview of how, how these tools are being used in different places. Um, one thing that we can do and will do in future projects, uh, but we haven't done officially really in any uh, planning initiative yet, is the uh, combination of geodesign with trade-offs, trade-off modeling. So this is not a trade-off model, but it does show the relative trade-offs of these four plans that I have turned on here um, in Barbuda. And this is just a training project. That's not the official project in Barbuda. This is just, you can get to this by going to training-barbuda.csketch.org. Training and all of these are, all these projects are available uh, by way of our, our projects page, which I'll show you again later. But uh, the reason I'm showing you this is because uh, if you're in a planning initiative and you're, you're, you're potentially trying to consider the um, relative trade-offs of, say, 10 or more uh, various proposals, having something like a trade-off plot is really nice. Um, it really shows you how various uh, proposals stack up against each other when it comes to various criteria. And this is just a two-by-two two kind of comparison. Um, it gets tricky when you start start to do um, uh, a three-dimensional or n-dimensional um, comparison. These sorts of visualizations get less useful. Uh, but we imagine doing this kind of thing even if we were comparing four different criteria, ecological value, fishing value, tourism value, and, I don't know, mining value or energy value. Um, we could we envision um, creating just multiple two-by-two two comparisons that, that help people understand the relative trade-offs between the proposals they've drawn. So trade-offs, uh, inclusion of Marxan, other modeling uh, techniques inside um, C-Sketch and, and combining with the geodesign process seems to me to be a really um, sort of complete package when it, when it comes to uh, supporting a, a planning initiative, particularly because um, all of these various approaches and data can be, and, and proposals can be discussed within these discussion forums um, and, and know that, that information can be uh, uh, captured reflected back to decision makers and um, memorialized. Uh, so one thing I, before I jump to that, I want to jump into the administrative interface. So what I've shown you so far is essentially the, 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 the key features for C-Sketch. What I didn't mention is that um, uh, in addition to sketching plans, one can upload shape files uh, to analyze them in lieu of sketching. They can also, um, instead of answering survey questions by sketching, they can also upload shape files to indicate, for example, where they're fishing or their areas of interest. Um, all of this, 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 uh, everything in C-Sketch is easily configured um, by way of an administrative interface, which obviously only uh, key people in a planning initiative have access to. Um, and I won't go into all the details here. I've done that in other places. You're welcome to sort of read up on some of these features uh, on our website. I just want to point out very briefly uh, that it's easy to set up um, groups, as, as the, the MAP uh, folks have done here, um, and give those groups access to uh, certain features like certain data sets or sketching capabilities or forums. Uh, data layers are e easily added as MAP services. Um, new forums are easily created uh, just by clicking a button and configuring that form for access by certain people. Um, sketch classes are the things that people draw 
So in the, in the North Pacific Coast, people were drawing sub-regional zones that could only be drawn in that sub-region, and then they were adding those zones to collections, which you can think of as just folders, so that those, those individual zones could be analyzed as a whole, as a group. Um, surveys are easily set up, and I'll show you a survey in just a second and show you how easily it was set up. Um, these were uh, like the ones that we used in Barbuda to collect information from fishermen on where they were fishing. They can be used for collecting any kind of spatial information. And the, the last thing I want to point out in the admin interface, because it's brand new, is this uh, use metrics tab. So a lot of uh, initiatives want to know um, how much their decision support tool is being used and who's using them. So I've just run a report in the MAP uh, project that's showing me the amount of activity in this project over a certain date range, uh, September 1 to 24. And it's telling me how many visits by people as a whole, how many of those visits were by administrators, how many new form messages have been posted in that, in that time period, new survey responses, you can tell there's no surveys going on right now in this particular project, and how many people have uh, signed up um, over this to, in other words, created a username and password to use this uh, particular project in the last month. This kind of information, um, I think, is really nice. It combines uh, some of the information that we can glean from uh, Google Analytics with some of the data that we're collecting uh, on our own, uh, in our own database. For example, uh, individual user activity. So there's right now, there's no visualization for that, but I could click this download report and get three uh, CSV files that show me how, how each individual in this project is using the, the tool. So how many sketches they've made, how many new forum posts they've made, how many times they've visited and when they visited, all that kind of stuff is available in a, in a CSV. So really useful for project administrators to know um, whether or not they're doing a good job with outreach and getting this tool in the hands of, of users. It's also really useful for kind of justifying uh, the use of a decision support tool if you've got people in your planning initiative who are skeptical about the utility of that tool. This can really show people uh, how often it's being used and who the power users are. It can also be used to guide the process, right? So if you discover in here that there are some users that are really using the decision support tool a lot, um, you can perhaps make them ambassadors for the tool and get them to teach others how to use it or teach them the value. Um, you can also discover who hasn't used the tool at all and make special, special effort to help them um, understand how the tool can be used and maybe uh, you know, set up some opportunities for them to sit with somebody to, uh, to, to um, get, their, get their input and designs. Okay, um, I'm, I'm almost done here. I just want to tell you about a few other uh, new features um, that might be helpful to you. I've mentioned use metrics. Um, I've mentioned that you can upload uh, shape files. Um, you can also export all of the forum content. So there's a button down at the bottom here that says download all forum content. That just dumps out all of the comments that people have made um, in, these, in these forums. And it also dumps out uh, a, a GeoJSON file that can then be used to create a shape file that shows where people have, um, show, that shows you the the plans that people have posted to these various forums. So if you're ever a part of a planning process where somebody you know, says, hey, give me all of your information, well, it's pretty easy in C-Sketch. You just poke the button and you dump all the information that went into the system. It's important for a lot of uh, government agencies. Um, there's, uh, I want to sort of, I know some of you have taken this survey already, but if you go to intake.csketch.org, um, you'll see a really, really simple um, survey that I set up that you're all welcome to take if you want. Um, it, you'll notice that it's just a real simple project. Um, there are no data layers to, to switch on and off. There's just uh, base maps that you can switch between. Um, and the idea is to sort of, so there's no, there's no data layers tab and there's no my plans tab. There's just this one tab that allows you to participate in a survey that says, you know, I'd like to use C-Sketch for these reasons, um, and my area of interest is here. Um, that can be submitted uh, along with a bunch of other information, um, and I can use that information to contact you and help you explore a potential use of C-Sketch. 
the same kind. So this is a really simple survey, um, and in the administrative interface, um, it, uh, so which is what we're looking at now. There's this uh, checkbox that says Enable Simple Map Mode. That's what allows me to just hide the Data Layers tab and have that really, really simple, sleek uh, map in interface for these surveys where I'm not interested in having people turn on off data layers. I'm not interested in having people sketch prospective plans. I just want to have them give me some information about this place. So this kind of thing could be used um, in the sanctuary nomination process where we have a really simple uh, map interface and people are just participating in a survey. By the way, this is not official. This is not sanctioned by the, the sanctuaries. Um, I'm just using it for demonstration purposes. But you could have people um, nominate the uh, new marine sanctuary um, by simply drawing a, a polygon in an area and saying, I want to have a new marine sanctuary here. And then C sketch would clip it to the, the shoreline and um, want to provide details and so on. Um, and then uh, one could check off various criteria that this is supposedly meeting, providing detail about those criteria and so on and so forth. Um, one can attach files, so PDFs and pictures or whatever to support their nomination um, and then submit this thing. Um, then all of these survey responses can be downloaded as a shape file and, um, or CSV files and uh, evaluated offline. So um, you could combine, you, here's a really, really simple uh, survey that took me all of, I think, 30 minutes to set up in C-Sketch. Um, here's one that's a slightly more advanced survey, uh, simply because it has more uh, functionality in the survey itself. It's also got the ability to just kind of sketch out various um, options for sanctuaries, uh, like we did in Barbuda and, in, and um, we're doing in other places, um, and retrieve reports on those designs. So here I'm just analyzing a design that I drew a couple weeks ago. Um, the idea here is to kind of help people understand what might be a good place for a sanctuary given NOAA's criteria for a good, good sanctuary um, by providing some, some analytical feedback and telling them, okay, well, this design overlaps this much state uh, water, this much federal water, the closest uh, population or, or area with population over uh, 50,000 is, um, you know, uh, 103 miles away or whatever. So people could use this to sketch out various sanctuary options and then submit them uh, to the survey, and uh, that, that the results of that survey could be provided to, to NOAA if, if they wanted that, which I'm not sure they did. Um, so that is a whole bunch of information, and I, I'm really curious to know what your questions are. Uh, instead of blabbering on more, I think I'll just pause here and see, um, Sarah, if, if, you, if, there, if you've gotten any questions so far that I might try to answer. Okay, uh, thanks, Will. And let's see, uh, we're, we're getting a few. We don't have a ton right now, but I wanted to remind everyone how to send in questions. You can type the questions into the question panel of the user interface, um, and then I'll relay them to Will. Or if you wanted to ask them directly, go ahead and raise your hand, and I'll unmute you, and we'll see if the, the audio works. Okay, uh, so a couple questions in right now. Let's see, can data be confidential or are these maps open to the world? Anglers are inherently shy about sharing secret fishing spots. How are these issues bridged and how valid are the data in relation to the issue? Yes, good question and something that we encountered in the Marine Life Protection Act and those sorts of surveys were actually conducted by Ecotrust and, and we handled those then as we sort of do now. Um, and that is by firstly telling everybody that we meet with that data are going to be confidential if they need them to be, um, that individual uh, survey responses will not be revealed to the public, so um, we won't say so-and-so fishes in this spot. Well, we'll, what we will do is create some sort of synthetic product that generalizes where people are fishing, um, and those data will be uh, either public, if that's okay with all the fishermen, or they can be locked down. So let me show you in, in the um, Blue Halo project, uh, we could have, although we didn't uh, because it wasn't necessary, uh, taken the, the fishing layer um, that was derived from those community surveys. So uh, where is it here? Um, uh, community surveys. Oh, it is locked down. Um, so these, they, these uh, layers you can see here where people are storing boats, uh, uh, tourism areas, um, snapper reproduction areas, so on, they have a lock next to them. 
uh, suggesting that it can only be viewed by certain individuals uh, who've been given given permission. So um, here I've specified, uh, let's see, um, oh, it's not this group, it's, it's this, this entire group of community surveys. Um, so we've said here that only Fishers, the science advisory team, and the, the staff and stakeholders who've been designated in these various groups in C-Sketch can view these data. Um, so there's, there's ways of keeping data private and only visible to certain groups. Um, and uh, there's also a lot you can do to um, help people understand the planning process and how the data are used. So I, we're, we're pretty confident that those data were um, valid. We spent a lot of time working with individuals and saying, you know, does this look right to you? Does this seem like a, a fishing hotspot? Um, and uh, we, we, we were confident in the end that, um, that the, the fishing hotspot map was, was, was accurate. Okay, thanks, Will. Um, there was sort of a follow-on um, in that theme, um, which was how do you bridge knowledge ownership issues? Bridging knowledge ownership issues, yeah. Um, I guess that's the same kind of thing that uh, when we were gathering knowledge from people about how the data were going to be used in the planning process, how they were going to be represented in the tool. Um, and, uh, and then we, after we added the data um, from the surveys to the tool, we spent time um, in, in groups and with individuals sitting down and again kind of reviewing how the data were going to look and how they were going to be used and that kind of face time, the, the, the one to one and, and one to many kind of face time um, was really important in, in getting people comfortable with the idea of contributing their knowledge uh, and contributing designs for uh, plans in, in, in uh, Barbuda Waters. Okay, that seems pretty reasonable. Um, let's see, there was a question. Um, I noticed in the map project that some rivers were included in the plan. How far inland does C-Sketch allow users to go? Ah, good question. So you're going to test my knowledge of this particular project, and I have to say that sometimes I don't know as much about these as I should. So um, we're looking at here the boundaries of the map study region. I'm going to turn that on. So here's, here is essentially uh, how far we went inland. Um, and I can't exactly tell you the criteria for why that stopped, but there's the visual representation of it. So pretty, pretty far, pretty far inland. And and I should just kind of elaborate, I guess, on this. Um, this is the entire map study region, but the the study region was broken up into um, four, five uh, subregions or four subregions. Um, I'll turn this one off so you can see what there are. Uh, so it's really the obviously the north. Coast subregion that went inland, the Central Coast subregion that went in inland, and the North Vancouver Island subregion. But there's this whole uh, other subregion, Haida Gwaii, which obviously didn't touch land. Uh, sorry, didn't go inland at all. It was included this island, um, but uh, didn't didn't go inland. Okay, great. Thank you, Will. Um, Let's see, another question. You stated that shapefiles can be imported. How did you transfer Angular data into shapefiles? Uh, well, in this case, we didn't, because uh, no, none of the none of the anglers um, were uh, you know, GIS savvy in, in Barbuda, where we conducted those surveys. Um, in the MLPA initiative, the Marine Life Protection Act initiative, um, there were we we weren't using Sea Sketch; we were using a previous tool called Marine Map, and there were some uh, anglers who were very well organized, particularly in the South Coast. Um, and had geospatial information uh, that they had collected, um, and they provided that the, those uh, shape files to people on the, on the initiative staff, and then we did some, some work in the back end. Uh, Marine Map didn't have at the time the ability to upload shape files, so but if we had we been using C Sketch, we would have simply uh, received those shape files from them, transform them to uh, the projection that C Sketch can accept WGS84, um, and then uh, just include them in a survey response. So um, specifically, I can show you what that would look like if we had done it in Barbuda. Again, we didn't have um, GIS savvy people on the island. There were no fishermen with, with uh, GIS data. But if they had, 
um, they could have take, uh, given us those shape files um, and then we could have uh, just clicked this um, upload a shape file button. Notice that there's a drag and drop shape file to the map. We're just taking the shape .shp file um, and dragging it on the map. That would have uh, then created something that looks just like a sketch. And just like a sketch, it would have been clipped to the study region boundary if it um, if it hadn't been already. And then it would just be another response, just like any other in the, the survey. Okay. Uh, there was a follow-on to this, and I I'm gonna. I don't quite understand the question is written, but this is what I think it's asking. Uh, if maps are annotated by anglers, um, how do you how how do you get the comments imported into software? Ah, okay. So, yeah, I'm not exactly sure what that means. So maybe I'll I'll, I'll try to answer that in a couple different um, ways. So if some an angler had created a shape file on a desktop GIS. And that uh, well, I was corrected, Will. It's not necessarily okay. comments, uh, lines, fishing locations, etc. Lines, fishing locations, etc. So so not, not necessarily comments. Okay, so ask me again, what's the question? Well, this was, okay, if maps are annotated by anglers, how would you re-comment importing, uh, it might be, how would you recommend importing these into, oh, that's what it is, recommend importing these into software? How would you they, recommend importing annotations such as lines, uh, fishing locations, etc.? Sorry. How would how would I recommend bringing them into yep. this software? Yep. Yeah. So um, it's it's pretty simple. If somebody has if somebody has a a, um, a shape file that has um, uh, polygons in it that represent uh, fishing locations, um, they just need to have the the shape file. You know provide the shape file to me or provide it as uh, with the projection WGS84 um, and then I import it into C-Sketch as either a sketch, a perspective plan, actually if it's a fishing location it wouldn't be a perspective plan probably, it would be more like a survey response and then that survey response um, is annotated and you know additional comments are added to it by way of the survey itself which has you know questions associated with every polygon that's drawn or uploaded as a shape file. And then, uh, um, yeah, then it just becomes part of the database. I'm not sure I'm answering that properly, but you know what? I'll let Tom. I'll let you follow up <laughs> with Will if if uh, that didn't get get the um, answer to quite the question you were asking. Let's see. Um, another question: Can the app use secure Arc server services? Yeah. So when a you when a uh, administrator adds a data layer, uh, they just um, point to C-Sketch to uh, um, uh, ARC service. And if the um, service requires authentication, then the administrator just enters in um, the username and password. The service is found. Um, and then if the, uh, if the administrator doesn't take the additional step of, um, let's say, this particular one was an authenticated data uh, layer, required authentication, which it doesn't. Um, if the uh, administrator doesn't say, okay, I only want to have these groups see the, that, that layer, then C-Sketch will simply serve up that layer to anyone in the public. So it requires the administrator to authenticate, but it doesn't require any other further. Uh, authenticated data layer and then designate certain groups um, in C Sketch to see it, then only those groups will see it. Okay, thanks, Will. And we are occasionally just getting some. Um, your your microphone is going out briefly, oh, but I, I think the gist of everything uh, was caught there. Um, okay, let's see. There was a comment, uh, and then presumably with relationship to Barbuda, uh, perhaps a layer by the Caribbean Environmental Economics Program, LASI, should be included. Ah, yeah. Well, so, and, and, and the, the planning process is over at this point, so um, we, you know, we, we won't be adding new data to this, but uh, yeah, you can, that, that comment kind of points out some of the challenges we have when doing a planning initiative like this. Um, we, we spent a good amount of time before we began planning trying to gather all the data uh, by talking to various government folks in, in um, Antigua 
and uh, scientists that we knew and kind of put out a call for data. But there's always going to be the, the problem of not quite having all the data that are out there simply because some of them are not discoverable. And that's, um, that just kind of points to some of the shortcomings of, of uh, our current GIS infrastructure, um, that not all GIS data that are out there are discoverable. And so the tool has to be flexible to take those data in when they become available. But I think you also, as a planner, have to recognize that you won't always have all the data that you would like when you begin planning. Okay, that's absolutely true. All right, um, I think mostly we have some quick questions we'll run through, and if anybody has any more, send them in. Um, this was also uh, in relation to the Barbuda um, case study. Is the habitat zone a vector or a roster layer? That is a vector layer, but we could have been a roster layer. I think it's a okay. vector layer. Um, okay. We can find out. And I'm pretty sure you answered this one uh, later in the presentation because it came in early, but can the software be used offline? Ah, good question. No, it can't. Um, it is an online tool, for sure. And um, there you know, might be some, uh, some value in developing this tool so that it could, could be used offline, but none of our clients who wanted to use this have, have uh, requested that, and therefore we haven't developed that um, capability. Okay. And can, can it do distance calculations? Yeah, so um, out of the box, any, any uh, uh, project can use these simple tools for doing things like measuring distances. Um, and that's, you know, that's just kind of a standard part of the Esri JavaScript API. Um, but uh, any operation that you can do in a desktop GIS, so a least cost path analysis or straight line distance analysis, any, any of those things can be done in coding a geoprocessing script that is run every time somebody uh, does this, where they click, um, you know, uh, view attributes and reports. So these reports, some of these reports in the map process, for example, show us uh, uh, distances. So let me see if I can find one here. I think there's one under human well-being. Um, um, governance, maybe, overlap, 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 um, one of these does, distance to nearest protected area, something like that. Anyway, I'll see if I can find it as, as we go along, but yes, any kind of geospatial analysis you can imagine um, can be run in C-Sketch, it's just a matter of encoding it to do it. Okay. Um, Thanks, Will. And so we actually have several other questions we won't be able to get to, but we are going to wrap up with a big one. Um, can you talk about costs? Yes. For using C-Sketch. Yeah, all of this is something that you can discover um, on our website if you go to csketch.org. If you click the purchase button and scroll down, you'll see what typical costs are. So um, we provide free licenses to educational institutions, um, but that's without support. Uh, and it's kind of, it, it requires a little bit of support in order to, to kind of use the tool effectively. Um, but with just, if, you, if you're purchasing a license for, let's say, a government agency or an NGO or something like that, um, the, the license fee is $1,000. And then um, we recommend getting at least four hours of support to help get up and going. Um, and then typically, group projects are somewhere on the order of fifteen dollars to $20,000. That, that gives you some training, some uh, simple reports, so we, we can encode some of those analyses for you and represent them in reports, um, and a little bit of technical support. The, some of our larger projects, like uh, the stuff that we're doing in, in Barbuda, that's, you know, the, the next place we go in the Caribbean will probably be about $80,000, because that, that requires some on-the-ground facilitation, um, and the addition probably of some, some new features that are particularly useful for that popu new population. Um, and so uh, we have a standard hourly fee, and we can use um, those hours in whatever way is helpful to you. And typically, it, it comes down to a little technical support, maybe a little training, some custom reporting, uh, some project support, and for, for some of the bigger projects, some custom development. So for example, the ability to view user metrics um, was something that one of our clients uh, wanted developed. Uh, so we you know, they spent something, I can't remember exactly how much they spent on that, but X amount of dollars. Um, once that development was completed, then it was a feature that was available for 
all CSketch users, um, that is all administrators in this case, uh, who, who want to view user metrics. Um, those, those features uh, tend to be some of the more expensive things to develop, um, and the reports and the analytics that we encode in CSketch are getting cheaper and cheaper. Sometimes it takes us you know, all of $5,000 to create a, a really uh, decent support uh, report. Um, other times, if we want to create really sophisticated reports, like the one in the MAP project that has the Mark Sand stuff, the invest reports, and the human well-being, and governance, all that kind of stuff, that might be a 160-hour project to create a, a real sophisticated report. So, well, short answer is as cheap as $3,000 um, and uh, upwards of uh, thirty dollars to $80,000 for big projects. Okay. Thank you, Will. Uh, Will, I'm also going to send you a, a report which has the other questions that we haven't had a chance to get to. So, Great. Uh, I will definitely follow up. Okay. So let everyone know who did ask a question that uh, we'll be sending those on. Okay. Thank you so much, Will. This was fabulous. So it, it, it's, it's been fun as coordinator of the EVM Tools Network to go from watching the tools develop over the years and now actually to seeing them used uh, and seeing the planning process that finished. So this is great. And there's lots of people saying thanks uh, coming in uh, on the comments. So uh, great. And thank you to everyone who uh, was able to attend today. We, we're really glad uh, you were able to make it and we look forward to having you on future webinars. Okay. All right. Bye, everyone.